OK, so today I'm presenting APEG's plan for impl implementing competency based assessment for geoscience work experience. So this is an outline of the presentation, so I'll briefly explain what competency based assessment is and why we are proposing to make this change. And then I'll talk a little bit about what the changes are going to be uh, and provide a high level overview of the competency based assessment framework. So as I said before, it's not going to be a detailed how to. Um, it's going to be fairly high level and then we'll talk um, a brief introduction to how the online um, assessment system works and then we'll have a chance for a question and answer period. So uh, competency based assessment is APEG's experience assessment system. So it's just an alternative way of assessing uh, work experience. So competencies are defined as observable and measurable skills, knowledge, abilities, motivations or traits required for professional registration. And the key thing is here that these are observable and measurable. So uh, that's a fundamental aspect of competency assessment. So competencies are demonstrated through the actions and behaviors of the applicants. And this type of assessment system is a more quantitative, precise, objective and transparent um, and consistent measuring system. So why are we changing to this? Many of you may know that we already use this type of system for engineering. Uh, so we, we want to get there for geoscience as well. So a number of years ago, there was a national uh, framework for engineering competency assessment that was agreed upon. So there was a uh, several stage multi year pan Canadian project um, that developed the uh, competency based assessment for engineering. And um, engineers and geoscientists BC have an online system that they developed for competency based assessment, and they uh, made that available to any regulators that wanted to use it for a user fee. And APEGS adopted that starting in 2019. So we already have. Uh, almost a year and a half of experience using competency based assessment for engineering and uh, it's been working very well. So uh, Geoscientists Canada has now developed a national competency framework and piloted, piloted it using a modified version of the uh, engineers and geoscientists BC online tool that was developed for engineering. So uh, APEGS participated in that pilot and we had several uh, applicants that went through this uh, competency assessment process for their work experience and uh, the whole thing worked very well and APEGS is very keen to implement um, this system for uh, geoscientists as well. So we are working with Geoscientists Canada and EGBC and so several other regulators to move from the pilot version to a finalized version by uh, January next year. So in order for us to move to uh, competency based assessment for geoscience, we need to make bylaw changes um, and bylaw changes need to be ratified by the membership. Um, by a vote at the annual meeting. So this presentation is mainly aimed at making sure that our membership um, is aware of the upcoming bylaw changes and so that people are informed prior to the vote and that people uh, support and participate in the vote um, on the bylaw changes. So as I said, there will be more details provided on the actual process later in the year and on an ongoing basis once it's actually implemented, assuming that um, the membership votes to implement it. OK, so the proposed changes. So we're not actually changing what is acceptable work experience for uh, geoscience. We're just defining it uh, better, being more explicit about what it actually is that we're looking for in your work experience in order for you to qualify for licensure. So um, we believe that the uh, 
competency uh, a system is more quantitative, precise, objective, transparent and consistent measuring system. And hopefully you will get a sense of that as I go through the presentation uh, here. Um, and based on experience, not just in the pilot, but with the engineering system, it increases the confidence of everybody who participates in it. Uh, the applicants, the validators, the employers and assessors and the experience review committee because it's much clearer to everybody what what it is that we're expecting. So as I said, the actual requirements haven't really changed. This is just a different way of measuring it. So you're still required to have a minimum of four years of experience and this will be tracked in the online system through a chronological employment history that will be provided by the applicant. So in that system you have to have at least four years of experience documented. You'll still be required to have one year of Canadian or equivalent to Canadian uh, experience. Uh, there's an exception for that if you are uh, using the um, experience review for waiving confirmatory exams. Um, and you still can get a minimum of three years of credit for international uh, experience and graduate studies combined. So uh, Canadian graduate studies does not count for the Canadian experience requirement. So those things are still the same as they are in our current system. So um, other eligible experience, so all post bachelor's geoscience experience is eligible. Uh, you're allowed up to one year of pre-grad experience, the same as it is in the current system. So that experience has to be from after the first half of the degree has been completed and it must be closely uh, supervised by a professional uh, geoscientist or engineer. And if you did start out as a technologist prior to completing a bachelor's degree, you can get up to one year of that uh, technologist experience um, credit towards the experience requirements. Uh, you can get up to 24 months of graduate studies, 12 months for a, a master's, a thesis based master's, and up to 24 months for a PhD, but only 24 months altogether. Um, for graduate study, so if you got 12 months for your master's, you can only get 24 months, uh, 12 months for your PhD for a total of 24. Uh, and you would have to enter your graduate studies as a period of employment history in the employment history table in the online system. So if you were doing uh, other geoscience work during your graduate studies, for example, as a teaching assistant or a research assistant work that's not related to your graduate studies, you can get experience credit for that um, or any other employment uh, outside of the university setting. And these would have to be entered in as separate employment periods in the employment history table. Um, so that's allowed, even though the time periods would overlap with your graduate studies, you would describe these as a separate uh, period of employment uh, in the employment history table. Okay, so uh, now on to the competency framework itself. So it's got a similar structure to the engineering system, but uh, it's different. There are a different number of competencies and different uh, categories. So there are a total of 29 competencies in geoscience. I believe there's 34 in engineering. Uh, there are four categories and there's one example required per competency that can be chosen from any of the uh, experience periods of experience that you've listed. Uh, in the uh, initial section that outlines the, the chronological experience history. So uh, within the framework, 
Um, in addition to the competencies themselves, there are also a list of examples for each competency, and these examples are just there to provide guidance on what type of content is likely to demonstrate that competency. So you don't have to use uh, one of the examples that are given. They're just there to provide some guidance to help um, you figure out what what from your work experience would be the best type of example to provide. So each competency is rated um, on a rating scale from zero to five, and you must obtain a minimum average rating of three for each category. So individual competencies could be less than three, but uh, on average for each competency category, you must have a minimum of three in order to pass. So these are the competency categories. So in the professional competencies, there are seven. Uh, in the competencies in scientific method, there are five. Uh, in competencies in the area of geoscience practice, there are seven. So this is an area that's relevant to the area that you particularly practice in. And so obviously you'd be expected to have sort of higher level competencies in the area that you're actually practicing in. So that's why that's a separate category. So there are seven um, competencies in that category and then 10 uh, competencies in the complementary category. So you can find a full listing of all of the competencies on our website under members and competency based assessment geo and uh, also I've provided the link there. So I'm not going to go through um, all of the competencies here today, but in future we will have presentations that will provide more detail on that. So as I said, there are six levels in the rating scale from zero to five. Uh, you must have a minimum of one for each competency in order to pass it. So level zero is not acceptable. So if you get a, a rating of zero on one of the competencies, uh, you would have to go back and either redo it or get some additional experience in that category before you would pass. And as I said before, the minimum average required for each competency category is three. So if you had less than one in one of the competencies or less than three in one of the competencies, you would have to have more than three in another competency. So here's a description of what those levels mean. So basically a zero is no exposure to the competency whatsoever. So obviously that's not acceptable because these are all required competencies in order to uh, get licensed. So zero is not acceptable. Uh, level three, which is the uh, what we would typically expect someone um, on entry to practice who has just about their four years or maybe a little bit more of work experience, they would be expected to be at this level. So they have applied the competency with limited supervision in situations of moderate complexity and moderate risk. However, there may be people applying for licensure that have been practicing for a very long time in another jurisdiction and they may uh, be practicing at a much higher level. So level five is described as applying the competency without supervision in situations of significant compl complexity and high risk. So here's an example of one of the competencies from the area of geoscience practice. This is uh, competency 3.1 and it is plan investigations based upon purpose of study incorporating existing site specific information and appropriate approaches. And the examples that are given for that competency, so these are types of investigations that would be acceptable and that would be that you would choose based on the area that you're practicing in. So if you work for the geological survey, you might choose geological mapping. If you work for an environmental consulting company, you might choose baseline monitoring or environmental site assessment and so on. So, so those are just there to give you a little bit of guidance on what we mean by the, um, what type of investigation would be appropriate.
OK, so moving on to the actual online system itself. And again, this is just a very high level overview of it to uh, to let you know where we're intending to go with this. Um, so the, uh, the first thing that happens is the geoscientist in training uh, would log into the online system and enter their information. So this would be including the chronological employment history, uh, their self rating of all examples. So um, the applicant rates themselves, the validators rate them, and then the assessors rate them. So um, there are three different uh, people rating it, all using the same rating scale. So the applicants would also enter um, the validators uh, contact information and then once all of the examples have been entered the validator would receive an automatic email and uh, that would uh, indicate that it would be up to them to go in and do the validation process so once the applicant has submitted all of their examples then the validators are notified and they get their own um, code to enter into the system directly and they would then give their rating on the competencies that they have been assigned and they would provide uh, comments and answers to a set of additional feedback questions. And then once all the validators had completed their part, um, APEG staff would be notified that all of the uh, validations are completed and then they would assign the assessors. So the assessors are members of the experience review committee and they would go in and review all the details, including the rating by the applicant, the rating by the validator and any comments from the validators and then they would rate each example. So the only rating that actually matters is what the assessor says. So there's no averaging um, of ratings from the different people that rate. The, uh, the rating by the applicant and the validator are only for information to help the uh, assessors. So the assessors will decide what the uh, final rating is. So the employment history section um, is a brief chronological summary to provide an overview of the applicant's experience. And before you can go in and write any specific competency examples, you have to fill in the uh, chronological summary um, because you need to have that there to refer to when you're writing your uh, competency examples. And for each period of employment, you have to include information on responsibility of the position, the start and end dates, the company name, the supervisor name, the location and the area of practice. So each competency example uh, has three components to it. So first of all, you have to provide a brief overview of the situation or problem that the uh, experience is related to. Then you have to describe the actions that you took in that situation, including geoscience judgments made or solutions found. Uh, this is typically the longest part of the example where you put most of the details. And then after that, you're required to uh, provide um, an outcome, so what the impact was of your actions, solutions or judgments. So it helps to provide some structure to uh, the competency examples. So validators are essentially the people that are verifying for APEGs that you did actually do the experience that you're describing. So normally these are your supervisors and it doesn't matter whether they're a professional or not because they're mainly just saying yes, they did this work at this level. Um, so it, if you get approval from APEGs uh, ahead of time, you can also have uh, colleagues, clients or consultants with first-hand knowledge of the work experience as your validators. So if for some reason 
uh, you can't get your supervisor to be your validator, uh, it is possible to choose somebody else with a prior approval from APEX. At least one of the validators uh, must be a direct supervisor and share your discipline of practice. And overall, throughout all of the years of work experience, you need to have a minimum of four different uh, validators uh, providing feedback on your experience. Uh, the exception is for academic review cases. So a minimum of two of your validators must be uh, licensed in Canada, either a PNG, a PGO, an engineering licensee, or a geoscience licensee, or equivalent in cases where they're uh, outside of Canada. And again, there's an exception for academic review cases, so they don't need to meet all of these requirements at the academic review stage. However, they do need to meet them before they uh, get to become professional geoscientists. So you need to have one validator per competency and one validator can validate more than one competency. So you might have some validators that are only validating one competency and others that are validating five or six or, or ten. So it just uh, it just depends on how many different uh, supervisors you've had over time. So combined, the validators firsthand knowledge uh, must cover as much of the experience as possible, but a, a minimum of four years of your experience must be uh, covered by uh, your validators that you've chosen. And in the case of the academic review files, they would need to have five years covered by their validators. So the, the critical thing about the validators is they must have um, direct personal and professional knowledge of the competencies that they are verifying. So you may have validators that are not given specific competencies, so you'll have a validator for each period of work experience that you put in the uh, chronological summary, and some of those may not end up validating specific competencies, but they will provide input into the overall feedback section. So your validators uh, will also serve as references on your PGO application. So uh, that's a different process. Uh, when you're once you've had all your experience uh, validated and accepted, then you still have to submit your professional geoscientist application. So that's a separate form and system from the competency based assessment system. However, uh, you will um, use some of the validators from your competency based assessment as references. So when you submit the uh, application, you have to make sure you list uh, their names as references on your application. So if they've already uh, done an assessment in the competency based assessment system, they won't be comp uh, contacted again. So whatever they put in the competency based assessment will be their their reference for you. Any references that you have in addition to those that are um, validating your experience would be sent um, a reference form directly from APEG staff. So you can have uh, references for your professional application who are not validators. However, at least one of the references on your PGO application must be a professional who has also validated some of your competencies. OK, so the plan for transitioning from the current uh, paper based uh, report writing system to the competency based assessment system. Um, 
So the plan is that this system will be implemented in January 2021. So if at that time you are a geoscientist in training and you have not submitted any experience reports, you will be required to start your reporting in the new competency based assessment system. And also if you applied to APEGS as a geoscientist in training on or after January 1st, 2021, you will also be required to report your experience in the new competency based assessment system. However, if as of January 1st, 2021, you have already uh, submitted one or more experience reports, you will have the choice of either continuing with reporting in the old system or going to the new system. However, you will be encouraged and invited to switch to the online competency-based assessment system. Okay, so in order to get from where we are now to implementing the competency-based assessment system uh, in 2021, uh, we need to uh, make changes to our bylaws. So as I mentioned at the beginning, bylaw changes require a vote at the annual meeting. So uh, sometime in the summer, uh, this coming summer, members will receive proposed bylaw changes with the annual meeting notice. So normally we have our annual meeting on the first Saturday in May. Uh, obviously that was postponed this year because of the COVID-19. Uh, the plan is that the annual meeting will take place on September 18th, 2020, and there will be a number of bylaw changes voted on, including this one. Uh, and at this point, we don't really know for sure whether we'll be able to have an in-person annual meeting. Uh, if not, we are in the process of making plans to hold um, a virtual annual meeting. So uh, stay tuned for, for what happens with that. So assuming that the uh, members vote to pass the bylaw change to implement competency-based assessment for geoscience, uh, it will come into effect uh, January 1st, 2021. So as I mentioned, this is a very high level overview of the competency system. Um, we will be having new member orientation sessions. Uh, so once you are registered as a geoscientist in training with APEGS, you will be able to attend one of those sessions and you'll get a lot more detail on the uh, process and this and the competency based system. Um, you can also find uh, more detail on it right now on our website, as I mentioned before, under members uh, competency competency based assessment geo. And uh, you can also go and take a look at the competency assessment system. So there's a, again a link on our website uh, to to go and have a play around in that and just kind of see how it works. OK, so that is it for the presentation. So um, now I'm going to get uh, Angela to take a look at the uh, chat and um, I will try to answer your questions. OK, so there's only one here that did not get an answer, and it says you mentioned low, medium and high risk. Can you please give more detail on that risk? OK, yes, yeah. so those are intended to refer to um, the the risk, um, the level of risk that the employer would be taking um, based on the results of the work that you're doing. So if you are building a um, uh, a model that's determining the resources for a, a, comp, a, a mineral deposit that's being developed and that's going to be used uh, to raise money on the stock exchange. Uh, that's a fairly high risk activity for your company to be doing with the uh, information that you've uh, collected and 
the model that you've developed. So it's it's yeah, that that's the intention. Does that does that answer the question? So that was the only question. Okay. Okay, well, I guess that uh, makes it all nice, short, and sweet then if we don't have any more questions. Um, the, um, oh, I see one more question here. Not related to the presentation, but has the pandemic slowed down on current reviews for applicants? Um, yes, it has uh, slowed things down a little bit because we had to spend a fair bit of time getting everything set up to run with staff working remotely so um, things are running fairly smoothly now and hopefully we'll kind of gradually get back up to speed with things but uh, yes some um, some things have slowed down a little bit because of the pandemic Okay, well, that's great. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And if you uh, think of any uh, questions after the fact, you can always send an email to us at apegs uh, at apegs.ca, um, and it will be forwarded to the appropriate uh, staff member to answer. So thanks again for attending, and um, enjoy the beautiful day out there today. Are you staying on for a second? Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's just us left now. So. Yeah. So I tried to. There were two people who joined by a phone number. Other than that, I tried to keep track. So there were twenty-six total, including me and Tina. Oh, okay. And then two that I don't know who they were. So. Okay. Okay, so that also quite a few people who who signed up didn't actually attend then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I guess you can only do so much. So maybe some of them will tune in tomorrow or sign up later today or something if they couldn't make it for some reason. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for helping. I that was very short and sweet. And yeah. Right. Did it make sense to you? Did, did, it, did it seem yep. like a good level of information? Yeah, I think so. All right, great. Well, thanks for your help. And uh, yeah, let me know if there's any more registrations later today and I'll uh, I'll get the invite sent out this afternoon sometime. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thanks. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye.